Hello, my name is George Barker. My pronouns are he, him, and I'm a white male with curly brown hair sitting in my bedroom wearing a black t-shirt. I'm coming to you from Screen Skills, where I work as an events producer and also where I program this session called Out of the Disabled Closet, Celebrating Talent in UK Animation. For those who may not know about us, Screen Skills is the industry-led skills body for the screen industries. So film, telev television, including children's unscripted and high-end, visual effects, animation and games. We support economic recovery and future innovation and growth across the nations and regions, really by investing in the skilled and inclusive workforce who are critical to the UK screen industry's global success. Inclusivity and creating opportunities to platform and celebrate underrepresented talent across our sectors is really at the heart of what we do. And so I'm thrilled that the British Animation Awards has kindly given us this time to celebrate some of the brilliant work from emerging deaf, disabled and neurodivergent talent out there in UK animation. I'm even more glad to say that today we're going to hear from industry professionals based in Scotland, Northern Ireland, Devon and the South East. So we're really showcasing the amazing talent spread across our nations. I'm also glad to be joining the British Animation Awards at such a timely moment. This February, we published an accessibility animation report, which was created by Think Bigger and produced with the support of the Animation Skills Fund with contributions from UK animation producers. In this report, we found that around 60% of disabled people surveyed don't think disability is openly discussed in the animation industry. Out of those surveys, we also found that there was roughly a 50-50 split between those who disclosed being deaf, disabled or neurodivergent to their employer and those who choose not to disclose this information to their employer. Today, we want to recognise the urgent need to drive forward the conversation around accessibility and inclusion in UK animation. In this session, we will hear both from employers and employees in the industry asking what we can do to improve standards and conditions for deaf, disabled and neurodivergent talent. At the same time, we really want to take this opportunity to celebrate some of the fantastic work that is being done across the sector by shining a light on the amazing creatives working animation right now. So first, you'll hear everybody introduce themselves in turn and we'll have an opportunity to see some examples of their work. After this, we'll bring everybody together to answer some questions including asking what it means to come out of a disabled closet to an employer. Thanks again to the British Animation Awards for having us. I hope you enjoyed this session as much as I've enjoyed pulling it together. I'm Joe Blandimer from Devon. I am a stop motion animator and I am the artist of a NFT project called Claymate. I'm also a short filmmaker and I'm a he, him, and I am white with brown hair. I've been animating since I was seven years old, and it's always been a big passion of mine. I've been making short films and have them in film festivals, and also currently it's the field I work in. Um, and you're going to see a clip of one of my animations called Overload, which is a short film about my experiences with being on a tube train in London and hopefully it's relatable. Enjoy. <laughs> There's a seat here. It's been great weather today, hasn't it? Yes. There's no need to be so rude. You couldn't even look me in the eye. Huh? So I made Overload to show my experience of living with Asperger's and how the train, the tube in London can be quite overwhelming. Um, and I wanted it to make sure it could relate to other people who felt in a similar way and just to generally raise awareness. I first started with 
2D animation when I was very young. Um, I got a computer from my aunt when I was seven and I just practiced how to animate just, just from messing around really and just having fun. And I eventually came across Claymation and I just, I just loved it because I loved how it's all very hands-on. You can sculpt things. It's not so much staring at a computer too much. As I got older, I started making animations with more darker themes. I really enjoyed horror and I found with Claymation, you can really make your animations look quite creepy. So I made a series on YouTube called Inside the Human Lab and I made a few other short films and they all in total managed to get 3.5 million views, which completely blew my mind. I'd never had such a wide audience and, and it was crazy. In more recent times, I've worked as a freelance stop motion animator, which has been quite fun, making lots of weird and wacky ideas. Um, and right now I'm the artist for an NFT project called uh, Claymates, which is on the Cardano blockchain and we've done quite a lot of stop motion projects and we've worked with the band Good Charlotte in America. We collaborated with them and I made a lot of like, I made the band members out of clay and animated, made album covers, stuff like that, which is quite fun. Um, and currently we're working on some quite exciting projects, which I can't talk about unfortunately. And I'm excited for the future and I'm hoping to make a short film soon as I haven't made one in quite a while. Hi, my name is Gronin McGuinness and I'm the creative director at Paper Oil Films. We make Pablo for CBBS, Happy for CITV and Lady Bird and Bay for OT. Thank you. My pronouns are she and her. The clip that I'm showing today is a clip of Pablo and it's set to the opening song. The opening song is all about Pablo who thinks differently and sees the world in different ways. And through his story, um, we encourage the audience to do the same. Pablo is autistic um, and the show is about his experiences as a preschooler. Um, a pre preschool experiences that are relatable completely to the audience, getting a haircut, buying a new coat, going to the park, all of the things that preschoolers do, but it just so happens that for Pablo, he experiences them through um, a different way of processing the world because he is autistic. Um, the reason that we came up with the book Animals was so that we could put the traits of autism on screen in a very natural way. Um, Noah can't read faces very well. Llama repeats things. Ren's a flapper. Mouse doesn't like loud noises or big smells. Uh, Tan can control his limbs very well. He's full of energy um, and draft loves facts. And um, we came up with this concept because we thought that by putting the traits of, on, of autism on screen in a meaningful way for the audience, um, we would create exposure to the traits of autism and through exposure, understanding, and of course, from understanding comes empathy. Um, and a, a really important thing about the book animals that I love is that they all coexist within Pablo. They are all part of who he is. They're his creative coping strategies, processing tools for the world. Um, so they really help us see that um, like anybody else, Pablo is many, many different things. He's not just one thing. He is many things as um, we all are and as all autistic people are. They're not just one trait, one thing. I'm Jemima Hughes. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a white woman with brown eyes and a long brown plaid. My electronic communication aid is mounted on my pink wheelchair. Unbound is my third commissioned animation made with Screen South in Folkestone for the BBC Arts and Arts Council England new creative scheme for filmmakers under 30. It's an abstract, 
cut out animation in the hand painted paper, and it challenges the way I'm perceived and pitied as wheelchair bound, and shares my joy in exciting activities both in and out of my chair. <laughs> Wheelchair bound. It sounds like a prison. Straps confine, limit movement. You see wheels. Handles. Can you see a person? My siege is what supports me to leave my walls, enables, frees me to explore. My wheels travel the world. And they dance, whirl in light and color, transmitting vibrations to my arms, my spirit. Spinning, I feel the music. I was commissioned to make Unbound just before the first lockdown in March 2020, and was shielding throughout the whole period I was working on it. We shot the film at home and all the meetings and collaboration took place online. I finished early in 2021, and Unbound was broadcast on BBC4 in December. I wanted to use abstract animation to communicate feelings and sensations relating to movement. I'm profoundly deaf and although my hands can't sign and I have to express myself in English, I think mainly in sign. So for me, color, shape and movement can often express emotion better than words. I had been thinking for a long time about animating the shapes and movement I see in Kandinsky's abstract geometric paintings, and I love the way some of his earlier work evokes landscape without presenting it literally. I also wanted to challenge stereotypes about wheelchair users as people with sad, immobile lives. Like many of my disabled friends, I dislike being described as wheelchair bound and enjoy activities where I can experience speed and different kinds of movement. I use cut out animation because I find it relatively accessible, although I don't have independent hand function. I can draw simple shapes with support. I then direct my peers to cut out and move the shapes, while I control drag and frame stop motion software with assistive technology, controlling the mouse with a voice activated switch. I wanted to use the subtle, varied colors and textures of wet on wet watercolor and painted the backgrounds and the paper for the cutouts with my PI then worked closely with an experienced motion graphics animator and editor who added more depth and free-flowing motion to my stop motion sequences. It was important to me to speak my poem myself with my communication aid. Very few people who use say AC, alternative and augmentative communication, are seen and heard in the media, and I'm keen for the voices of AAC users to be accepted and normalized. As a deaf filmmaker, I also wanted the subtitles to be part of my film, and took care to select a font and color which was as visible as possible while working well with the animation. I hope my film contributes to a more positive view of disabled people and helps viewers to understand that we don't all feel imprisoned in our wheelchairs. With the right access and support we can live full, exciting lives. And I hope the color, animation and music allows others to share my joy and exhilaration and understand my response to life as rich and exciting. So my name is Paula Newport. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the director of People and Culture Arm and Animations in Bristol. Um, I'm five foot four-ish with blonde-ish shoulder length hair. I'm wearing a black and white stripy top and a black corduroy pinafore dress. 
Um, and also I'm wearing glasses because I'm very short sighted. So uh, in case you didn't know, Arvin Animations makes animated content. So series, short films, feature films, uh, feature length productions. And we also make console games. Those are our sort of main areas of, of production. Hello, my name's Holly Summerson. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a white woman with short ginger hair. I'm wearing glasses, a hearing aid with some fun silver uh, jewellery attached, a yellow shirt and a green and brown cardigan. And I'm sitting in front of a white wall. I am a freelance animator and director. I usually work in um, 2D, hand-drawn, mixed-media techniques. Um, and the clip that I have for you is some test animation that I've been creating for a dark comedy short film that I'm working on at the moment. It's called Living With It, and it's about a young woman who lives with a disease. Um, who is brought to life as a, a supernatural chaotic flatmate. Um, it's about her learning to live with him and uh, to accept her life being a little different than what she might have expected. So that was some test animation that I've been working on over the last few months. Uh, since being lucky enough to receive funding from Sharp Shorts, which is a short film um, development and funding program here in Scotland. I'm co-writing Living With It with Nikki Rooney, who is a very funny and very talented screenwriter. Um, and this story has really come out of conversations between us about um, the kind of shared things within our quite different experiences of um, illness and disability. It also comes from wanting to explore the feelings around accepting and embracing your body and life how they are rather than focusing on um, the expectations that you or other people might put on them and the way that disability as awful and um, difficult and annoying as it can be it does also just become part of your normal day-to-day -day life uh, so working with Nikki I'm working with um, a team where the majority of us like do have um, personal experience with this stuff. I think it's given like an honesty and a complex understanding behind um, the story and the humour and it's been a real privilege to work in an environment where we can be so like open and honest with each other. Um, and unfortunately that's still quite a rare privilege um, and this being a disabled story from a disabled team is something I think we all feel quite strongly about. So it's hugely influenced by disabled experiences and it's kind of hard to even uh, like separate those um, two things from each other. Um, I've directed um, a couple of short films before and I work on all sorts of different like commissioned projects, um, some of them in the charcoal style that you've just seen but also using um, collage, paint on glass, drawings, paper cutouts and also like mixing those things together digitally. In the final version of Living With It, it'll actually be um, incorporating more like colours and textures along with the um, black and white animation. I also tend to work on projects on the themes that are important to me, um, but Living With It is um, definitely the most kind of personal um, project that I've ever worked on and it's, even though it's so like fantastical and unreal, um, and it's the most directly influenced by being a disabled filmmaker. It's also my first fully funded short film, so it's very exciting, it's kind of scary, um, and I'm really happy to be making it and um, sharing it later this year. So 
So the first thing to say really is that we want you to work with us. It's really important that our content is authentic and appeals to an audience that fully represents our society today. Um, and our stories are only authentic if they're told by people with those lived experiences. So this includes off-screen and on-screen talent. So in animation, our characters need to be more diverse, as well as the people operating, the equipment behind the scenes and the animators, of course. Um, and it's, it's a well-known fact that the more diverse and inclusive a studio is, then the more successful that studio is as well. It makes good business sense and I think it also will make people happier to see lots of different sorts of people uh, in their work environment. People who are neurodivergent who are wanting to get into animation, I think the best thing is to make animations you want to make and make them personal to you or make them so it's taking your own opinions and your own experiences and telling a story because with animation it's a great way to share your own feelings and emotions and I think as well as that it's just really just learning from your mistakes and and just keeping it up and and just enjoying it because it is fun it's really fun animating. What I would say um, to neurodivergent, deaf, disabled talent who want to get into this industry is it's a wonderful industry, it's a creative industry and animation means that you can do it um, sitting at a desk, it's not like live action um, which calls for different locations, different buildings and um, pretty much you will find um, working in this industry joyous um, it's creative and such a variety of people working in this industry um, and this industry is strapped for talent so we need you my identity and experience as a disabled filmmaker is central to the content of my three commissioned films they each have a voiceover spoken on my communication aid. I'm really keen for the voices of AAC users to be heard in the media. In imagination, creativity animates the world and makes it accessible, transforming and enriching life. Technology for talking explains how and why people use electronic communication aids and tries to promote wider understanding of our communication needs and unbound challenges for wheelchair-bound stereotype. However, I hope this doesn't mean I will only be seen as a disabled animator. I want to make artist films which will be of interest beyond the disability community and I have made other small-scale no-budget films which do not focus on disability. Being disabled um, has influenced my work. I'm not going to pretend that it's all been amazing but I do think um, having... It's, it's forced me to get better at like asking for help and working more collaboratively um, and making the most of things that other people are great at but I'm not um, and also like knowing my limits and boundaries I think those are all really um, important things I'm also really inspired by um, disabled creatives who are like being really innovative and creative with the ways that they um, work with like accessibility um, and so it's it's kind of increased my awareness and my interest in like how people are accessing your work um, and different ways of, of making that better. Being on the spectrum has influenced my animations in a way in which I've made short films showcasing how it feels but also just in general animating. I completely focus on animating and throughout many, many years, I've, I've always just spent hours and hours and just each day, just really just practicing my skills. And I feel like if I hadn't, if I didn't have Asperger's, I wouldn't be so focused on animating and I'd be wanting to do other things.
being on the spectrum has had its challenges with being an animator because a lot of animation is based on body movement and sometimes it can be quite difficult to read people's body language but luckily a lot of animation can be quite bold and exaggerated so that makes it easier but it has helped quite a lot in understanding people. One of the biggest challenges that I found like trying to get into the industry has been you know when you're starting out and you're applying to a lot of different places and getting a lot of rejections and you're trying to kind of you know present yourself as like the best option to um, employers it's the you know the best good quality work but also like being able to work quickly and you know to a tight deadline and to a tight budget and um, it can be quite challenging when you know oh at some point in in the near future I'm not going to be able to work for three weeks or I'm going to have to ask for like kind of extra access needs or to work in a slightly different way to make this possible for me you know when you're right at the beginning of your career and you're often asking people maybe to take a bit of a gamble on working with you it can be quite like intimidating and um yeah like challenging to um to go to new places um as a disabled creative I was not able to access any formal film education, so my experience of animation was through free online courses and small projects with charities, community groups and a care centre, and I had a lot of support and access needs. When I expressed interest, the Scream South team were very supportive and encouraging. They understood that I needed plenty of time to communicate in interviews and meetings, arranged BSL interpreters for training events, and with my first film they provided some additional mentoring to support the development of my idea into a broadcast quality film. It was a huge learning curve, and gave me the experience and confidence to move on and apply independently to make a BBC Ideas film. Someone might not want to disclose being disabled or deaf or neurodivergent to their employer because people do still get discriminated against in the industry and you only have to hear like a couple of horror stories um, about you know suddenly not getting offered work anymore or being treated kind of as a problem whatever it is for you to then kind of have to assume the worst a lot of the time um, because you can't afford to find out whether that's whether that's true or not well I, I'm going to answer that question as an employer and I think that some people might, might choose not to disclose a disability or neurodivergence or deafness or you know to an employer but as an employer please do because um, we need to know we need to know the circumstances in which you best work we need to be able to manage people and and uh, to, to 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 feel safe um, and settled and secure so that when all those needs are taken care of you are freed up to do your best work some people don't disclose that they're deaf disabled or neurodivergent to their employer because they're scared of judgment and people people are scared that the the employer is going to judge them that that they're not as good as someone who isn't disabled which which is not a good thing because everyone's equal and even and a lot of people have strengths which other people don't have so it's you know you can't judge two people and i think it's important to to show and say who you are and 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 to recognize recognize your strengths um I think it's because people might feel it's it's going to disadvantage them if they do that. I don't think historically the industry has been that that welcoming in the past um, uh, as it uh, to what it perceives to be different. 
And many studio spaces, as we know, have narrow corridors, they have dark spaces, loads of electrical cables running around, which aren't easy to get around at the best of times. So physically, I think it's not inclusive. Um, and I think there's also the freelance factor. We know that many freelancers are not open about, for example, mental health struggles. Um, and this is predominantly because they're afraid they're not going to get work as a result of it. So they keep things under wraps. Um, I think the same could be said for those people who are deaf, disabled or neurodivergent. There's clearly a lot more that we can do as an industry to encourage people to not only feel safe to talk openly about these things, but also to feel confident that they're actually going to be heard. The worst thing about this is, is any sort of lip service at all. I think uh, this is about transparency and how we recruit. Uh, you know, we all know when the pressure is on a producer or a production with tight deadlines, tight budgets, it's all too easy to go to the same group of people that you've used before. Um, obviously, the downside of that is this makes the industry a closed shop with limited opportunities for people not already known. So that little black book, unfortunately, that is is still is still going on, although I would really hope that people are becoming a little bit more open about, about using different people and understanding that, this, that there are skills out there that we're not tapping into. Um, I think fully open recruitment is a big part of this. So targeting the places that you know your candidates will be looking, uh, infiltrating specific groups, communities, um, using language free of bias in the application process. And I think think building flexibility into the ad around different ways of working. Uh, I think training producers and recruiters in equality, uh, diversity, inclusion, uh, as well as unconscious bias training, it's something we do here. Um, and also tracking who your candidates are, where they're seeing your job ads uh, is really important as well to work out whether you're actually targeting, whether you're actually uh, effective in your recruitment strategies. So are you reaching the sorts of people that you want to reach? And actually tracking your candidate data can really, really help with that. Um, I think also building links and relationships with groups and communities. So this is about getting out there, getting the message out there. There's a whole load of jobs in the industry. And I think engaging with kids as well, looking at the next generation of talent, being open to perhaps different backgrounds, people coming without degrees, you know, it's it's amazing actually. I think we've recently learned that 60% of our workforce have a degree. We don't ask 60% to have a degree, but they seem to come. So it's just about looking at widening those access points as well. I could go on for ages about this. It's a real passionate subject of mine. In order to be more inclusive in the future, I think we need to, as employers in the UK animation industry, um, see the benefits of that to our shows, to our teams. Um, what do we want? We want original content. We want new ways into stories. We want fresh ideas for stories. So we're not going to get that if we just do things the way we've always done them. Um, we have to be open to doing things in a different way and working with all kinds of minds um, and find ways to put all kinds of minds together so that it's not just always the same people doing the same thing in the same way because if you want to do something differently tomorrow don't do the same thing that you did yesterday uh, so I think to be more inclusive in the future we just first of all have to say do you know what this would really benefit our companies um, in that way and our work. Um, there's a massive talent shortage, um, definitely in Northern Ireland, but I hear that it's true across the UK and we need to encourage new ways of thinking and um, different, different groups of talent into our industry um, in order to become just the most creative, have the freshest ideas for the future going forward. When the first lockdown was announced, I was confident that it would not prevent me from working on my new creatives film. 
and as more and more people got used to working from home, meeting online and transferring material electronically, it all seemed easier and easier. This way of working is very accessible for me. I don't have to worry about wheelchair access or whether there will be a changing place toilet with a hoist anywhere within walking distance of my destination, which is often the biggest problem with going anywhere. It has also proved quite straightforward to organize BSL interpreters for online events, because location and travel are not an issue, and an increasing number of events seem to be offering interpreters. I've enjoyed more film festivals online than I could have attended if I had to organize and pay for travel and accommodation. Of course I will be enthusiastic to get back to some face-to-face -face networking and events when it feels safe for me to do so, but I hope a lot of things continue to happen online or offer the option of joining online in the future. So during the pandemic with the increase of things being online, I think that has um, opened a lot up a lot more um, accessible ways of doing things, whether that's like captioning, interpreting, different ways of accessing things, physical access. Um, now, I'm not sure how much of that is kind of being brought back out into the real world. And I think there is a bit of a danger of things becoming, you know, some disabled people being even more excluded because they're still having to shield because the pandemic is still ongoing. But if the majority of people aren't in that situation, then they can end up getting kind of forgotten about. So I would say a cautious yes, things have got better. An optimistic yes, because I think there's definitely been a, an increase of awareness, um, but there's also definitely still stuff to be done. In the years to come, I'm looking forward to making more short films which have deeper meanings and about themes and issues in the world which I'm passionate about. That's my main goal, but also I just I just hope to make make little little animations and just enjoy sculpting clay and maybe branch out into other um, forms of um, like craft and and sculpting as well. That's always interested me too, but I just think the most important thing is just to be creative and, and to enjoy yourself and enjoy art in, in general. We are working on a new series of Pablo 3 at the moment. We're in development uh, with the BBC on that. Um, and I just think it's really testament to the fact um, uh, we're doing new things with series three for Pablo and I can see it running and running. And it's really testament to the fact of like, um, you put the autistic kid on screen front and center um, and have a core cast that's all autistic and make that a mainstream international success then that's just a really good thing to do um, so we're really really hopeful about pablo series three it's very different pablo is older it's more comedic more action-packed not say too much more than that uh, but we're very excited in how that's developing. I kind of think we need to be, as an industry, more open-minded. There are loads of different roles that people could do. It's it's much more than about working on the studio floor. Uh, the, the opportunities are endless. So I think we need to uh, be more accountable as employers. I've been building my website and enjoying experimenting with different media including leaves and textiles in 2D animation. In the near future, I'm hoping I can learn to manipulate my handcrafted materials digitally using my switch control, so that I can build independently on some of the techniques used in Unbound. I'm also finishing a silhouette animation of a Shakespeare sonnet. In future I will go on making short films independently, try to get my work funded and seen on different platforms and at festivals, and look for opportunities to make commissioned work, perhaps for disability-related organizations. 
At the moment, I'm working on a new animated dark comedy short called Living With It. Um, it's about a young woman who lives with a disease which is brought to life as her chaotic supernatural flatmate. And it's about her learning to live with him and about um, embracing and accepting your body and your life the way that they are rather than um, how you might have expected things to be um, and the way that disability or illness kind of becomes a part of your day-to-day -day normal life. Um, and that's being funded by Sharp Shorts and should be coming out later this year so I'm very excited um, to begin animating on that project soon.